<sighs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our, what is it, April 8th, which I think is still a Wednesday, right? Everybody, Wednesday? Is that the day we're on? <laughs> um, our April 8th edition of Chatting with NDGS Paleo. Uh, we have another guest speaker with us here today. Um, <clears throat> but this one actually ties really well to some work that we're currently doing on specimens here in North Dakota. Uh, so I am going to uh, introduce them and then give a little intro to kind of the North Dakota tie-in and then hand it off and, and let them take us on a nice adventure. Um, so today our guest is Dr. Stephanie Drumheller Horton. Uh, she is an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, she got her PhD at the University of Iowa and she studies uh, bite marks and other feeding traces. Um, largely on crocodilians, uh, but kind of generally specializes as well. Because um, once you see one bite, they're all the same, right? No, that's not so, um, <laughs> but we have been working um, a bit with Stephanie on some projects here in North Dakota as well. And I'm going to share my screen really quick to show you that tie-in. Is that working? Yep. All right. So this image here, this is the tail section of our Dakota the Dinosaur Mummy, which was previously on display at the Heritage Center and State Museum in Bismarck, and is currently off display for a new exhibit. Um, that exhibit should have been going up shortly, but with everything going on and the building closed, um, we're probably looking at this going up on display in the fall of that at this point, and we'll let everybody know with a big announcement when that's gonna happen. Um, but this is the tail section from Dakota. So this is towards the body over on this side. This is where we connect up to the rest of the body. Uh, this is the vertebrae. You can kind of see the imprint of the underlying bones running through here, coming down out towards the tip of the tail over here. And you can see everything is really nicely preserved skin. Um, and remember with Dakota, this is the actual skin preserved on the specimen. It's not an impression, it's the real skin. Uh, so what you're seeing is nice, beautiful skin coming along. And then you can see over here, it gets a little bit funky in this area. And if we zoom in to that area, you can see these long furrows and cuts through the skin through this area, as well as this very beautiful tear that comes down from the top edge of the tail into the skin down in this area. And so this is an area that's going to be highlighted in the new exhibit to show off. And these are more than likely feeding traces. I think our current thought is that these are potentially claw marks from some animal that was either pulling at the, the tail with its hand or feet, um, or maybe standing there and bracing itself while it fed on other parts of Dakota. Um, and kind of the bigger project we're working on with Stephanie is that there's actually quite a few more bite marks on this specimen than just this spot on the tail. And so Stephanie is leading some research on identifying those bite marks and interpreting what they tell us about um, maybe how Dakota died, but at least what happened to Dakota after it died and before it got buried and preserved. Um, so she's not gonna talk about Dakota specifically today, but she is gonna talk about other research that ties back to Dakota. So just to be aware that there's some great stuff coming um, from our crew in collaboration with Stephanie on Dakota along this lines. So with that, I will hand it off to Stephanie and let her explain uh, her talk and take us on an adventure. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. All right. This is going to be just sort of a, a broad overview of a lot of my research involving crocodilian bite marks and some of their more distant relatives. So pulling together a lot of different studies, including an old one I did uh, with Dr. Boyd. So there we go. Sorry, slides weren't advancing. In studies of croc diet, we have this sort of campfire story about snout shape. So if you ask most people, how do you tell an alligator from a crocodile from a gharial, they'll say, look at the shape of the snout. So alligators have sort of a U-shaped snout and crocodiles have a V-shaped snout and then gharials are sort of murder tweezers. Um, this it works if you're looking at American alligators and Nile crocodiles, but even in the modern, it kind of falls apart. So there are plenty of caimans that have sort of pointy faces. Uh, but then we take this sort of broad brushstroke pattern of snout shape and we start talking about 
diet? What are they eating with those differently shaped snouts? So the idea being, if you have a long skinny face, maybe you're eating fish. And if you have one of those big, broad triangular faces, you're eating kind of whatever. Um, and if you have a little short stubby face, maybe you're specializing in hard prey. And this is so well entrenched in paleontological research that we'll often take those broad brushstroke patterns and we'll apply them to things that maybe superficially kind of look croc-ish, but aren't actually crocs. So Charistideers, Phytosaurs, neither one of those is actually particularly closely related to modern crocs, but they have similar body plans. And then even your Spinosaurid dinosaurs, there's a lot of sort of analogous, uh, analogous research saying, look, it kind of looks like a gharial, so fish eater. But, you know, things get kind of messy when we look at the fossil record. If you ever want to make a croc paleontologist just gag, tell them crocs haven't changed since the time of the dinosaurs. Uh, because it doesn't take much scratching in the fossil record to find weird stuff. So one example would be the hoofed crocs, the much more terrestrial crocs. So these guys have these sort of narrow, deep snouts. Their teeth look very mm, superficially similar to theropod dinosaurs. They oftentimes have some tips of their toes that make us think they were far more terrestrial than many groups. We've got things that look like surfboards. Um, I have no idea what they were doing with those snouts. There, there has been some research to say that they might have had a gull or pouch, kind of like a pelican, but they're, they're really weird and we don't have anything like that still around in the present day. And if you go even further back, we start getting into just wacky things that people sometimes think I'm lying to them when I say, nope, this, this is a croc relative, it's not a dinosaur. So when we're trying to take these patterns from the modern and these assumptions we have about how you know, crocs are these primordial creatures, it really doesn't work. Uh, things get a lot more complicated when you dig further back into the croc family tree. Um, a lot of these early Triassic ones were even sort of doing the dinosaur thing before they were actually dinosaurs around. So but keep that sort of in the back of your mind because I've been trying to tease out patterns in bite marks and feeding behavior and who was eating what and how the food webs fit together. And we can't really just take the modern and project it into the past. So previously we've had broadly five snout shape classifications that we've erected to try to discuss things that are either uh, within Crocodilia or their closest relatives in the fossil record. So we have those broad snouted things that we associate with a generalist diet. We have those long slender snouts that we think of as maybe fish eaters or small prey eaters. We have the little boxy headed guys that often have anvil shaped teeth. So they were probably eating hard stuff, turtles, mollusks, that kind of stuff. Uh, we have our surfboards doing the surfboard thing. Um, and then our xiphodonts, those much more terrestrial guys. It would be really nice if this lined up with how these groups were related. Like, is there the skinny face clade? Is there the boxy headed clade? And that is not how it works. So snout shape changes all over the croc family tree. Um, it's, it does seem to be related sort of to diet, but it doesn't neatly line up. So they don't all group together by snout shape when we look at their classification. One pattern that we can tease out is the diversity does seem to track climate. So in general, when it's warmer, they spread out and diversify. When it's colder, we often see fewer groups. So this is just a diversity curve tracking uh, how many different groups we have through time. Now, there are some really good functional reasons to break up these classifications the way we do. And one of them is just, from, I guess you could say from an engineering point of view, um, this is a study where we were essentially hijacking some techniques used by engineers to test material properties. So engineers use it to make sure that their building's not gonna fall over. Paleontologists use it to figure out where are areas that are under stress if a skull of this shape bites something. So as you can see in this, you, the, basically the warmer the, the colors, the more stress you're getting. And in general, those big broad faces tend to resist twisting a lot more and those long skinny faces tend to be a little bit weaker to that. So if you're looking at something that's maybe taking larger prey, having a big triangular snout makes sense. And if you're taking smaller prey, but you want that snout to zip through the water, 
a long slender snout might make a lot more sense. We see this play out in the fossil record. So if you have multiple species all together in the same site, they don't normally look exactly the same. They often kind of divvy themselves up by snout shape. So we call this niche partitioning. It's basically everybody's doing different jobs in their environment, so they're not directly competing with one another for resources. So this is just an example from a project I'm working on in Texas where we've got a big broad-headed generalist, a, a skinny snouted small prey eater, and then this tiny little omnivorous blunt-faced thing. This is an example where they actually have seven species all together in the same site, which is kind of fun and kind of bonkers, but again, their snouts don't look the same. They seem to have been doing different jobs. But we found some problems with this, um, things that aren't quite nicely lining up with this picture of putting things in these snout-shaped boxes and calling it a day. So this is some, some research by Greg Erickson, who's actually the person featured in this picture, where he was taking force plates and getting modern crocodilians to bite them. And my understanding from seeing some of Greg's talks is that that stick got progressively longer as the project went on. Uh, so I think he started with about that long. It's like, let's, let's come out here. But they would basically put this little force plate, which I guess think of it like a scale, and the same point in their mouth and let the animal bite it and measure how hard they were biting. And everybody was sort of expecting that the slender snouted guys would have a wimpy bite because whatever, you eat fish, who cares? And the big broad snouted guys would have really powerful bites. And nope, um, it, it seems to really just line up with body size. Now, gharials are the sort of perennial odd man out, but there are plenty of other slender snouted groups up here. So here's Temestima that are all really nicely falling in this range. So, all right, why are the slender snouts biting so hard? But sure, okay. Um, I recently did a study surveying death roll behavior in crocodilians. Um, it's, it's a really dramatically named behavior, but the short version is these guys don't have opposable thumbs. They don't have tools. So if you're going to rip off a piece of meat that you can swallow, one way to do that if you have a body plan like a croc is to bite onto the prey, fold those arms and legs down, and then use that big powerful tail to throw your whole body into a spin and twist off a bite of meat. So again, this was something that there was a really well-established assumption that only those big heavy-headed generalists would do this and the slender snouted guys would not but you can see kind of in this picture that's an indian gharial um death rolling actually to try to escape being captured so as it turns out basically everybody death rolls and it doesn't matter what your snout shape looks like and frankly, if we go back and look at what these animals are eating, so just go out and make observations in the wild, apparently this false gharial did not get the memo that it was only supposed to be eating fish because that's a turtle. Uh, so that's a piece of what we would think of as a hard prey. So why, why aren't you only eating fish? So again, the, these groups are sort of overshooting what we've been saying that they should be doing and then projecting into the fossil record. So how do we really get at diet in the fossil record? Um, there's a couple different lines of evidence that paleontologists can use. One of them is gut contents, which is exactly what it sounds like. So we will find a really well-preserved articulated fossil and there will be basically the last meal hanging out in the abdominal cavity. This is ridiculously rare in crocs. I only know of two examples and you have a text example because that's the best example I have to share with you. Um, there's probably a really good reason for that though, and I'll, I'll talk about it more on this slide. Another line of evidence that we can use is from coprolites. So that's basically fossilized poop. Why is it that gut contents and coprolites are not super useful in crocs? Well, the gut contents are just stupidly rare. So we have a couple and they're awesome, but that's it. But at the end of the day, croc digestion is kind of bonkers. Um, it is ridiculously acidic. It's ridiculously destructive. There's been some work with modern uh, droppings that show that you really don't expect bone or much of anything to survive the process. So kind of once stuff goes down the hatch in a croc, you're not, you're not gonna be finding terribly useful material after that. So these are actually 
fossil uh, coprolites that from the shape we associate with crocs from that same site in Texas I've been working on, but is there anything useful inside them? You will be playing with the chemistry later, but not in terms of large identifiable fossils. So that leaves us with anatomy, and I love all of my colleagues who are working at it from this end, and also bite marks. So when I talk about my bite mark research, a lot of times people are like, that kind of sounds like CSI. Um, and you're absolutely correct. Most bite mark research that has been done uh, in the literature, you look at it and it's being done by anthropologists and some of them from a forensics point of view. So this is actually an image of some rodent bite marks on some cow bones that was performed by some forensic anthropologists at my university, the University of Tennessee. This type of research goes back a ways. So the earliest study I've been able to find was William Buckland, all the way back in the 1820s, where he basically found a bunch of smashed up bones in a cave and said, that looks like someone ate them. And I love these papers. You, you go back and read these papers from the 1800s, and it's literally like, well, I took some bones and I found a traveling circus and I threw them in with the hyenas and I got samples. Here's my paper. I'm like, man, I would love to be able to get away with that kind of methodology today, but... Uh, but the punchline is the idea is not terribly different. We take modern um, specimens, we put them in with predators, we let the predators eat on them, we then get whatever bones back we can, look at those specimens and see, can we tell them apart? If the answer is no, it's, it, you know, they're fun oddities, but it's not terribly useful for figuring out behavior and diet. But fortunately, when you have differences in behavior, differences in dentition, that does tend to get reflected in what those bite marks look like. So the first study on crocodilian bite marks was done by Jackson Zhao, and he was very specifically looking at Nile crocs in sort of a paleoanthropological framework, so looking at some of these early human fossil sites. That paper came out while I was in graduate school, and I was also looking at doing croc bite marks, so I went to the St. Augustine Alligator Farm, uh, which is in St. Augustine, Florida, and as, I, as we were discussing before we started, it is the only place in the world that has every living species all together in one place. So it's like one-stop shopping for research. And they love researchers. They love letting people come in and work with their animals. So I basically took cow and pig parts, and I threw them in with the animals, and then we got the bones back again, and that was the more exciting part. Uh, they didn't always want to give them back, and we would then clean them up, get the soft tissue off the bones, and then look at the traces to see how do these look in comparison to, say, mammalian bites or dinosaur bites or any other vertebrate bite mark that we know of. So who got what was pretty much determined by how big you were, because we didn't want the animals to just swallow the whole thing, because again, they're, it's gone, nothing to get back. So the big guys got those partially articulated cow legs. The little guys, this is an, a ridiculous example, but the little guys got these pig femora. We did do some group feeding with American alligators where we basically took those cow legs, multiple ones, and just threw them in an enclosure with multiple animals and let them do whatever they wanted for extended periods of time. Um, gathered all those up and brought them back. And we found some really nice patterns that we can then project back into the fossil record. So these are just a couple examples of crocodilian bite marks from this modern sample I collected. Back in 1980s, um, a man named Binford actually erected this classification scheme on the anthropological side of things that's really straightforward. Basically, if you have a, a tooth that impacts the bone but doesn't punch all the way through, that's a pit. If it punches all the way through, that's a puncture. If the tooth drags along the surface but doesn't fully in dent it, that's a score. If it does fully pierce the bone and drag through it, that's a furrow. So here we've got pits, punctures, scores, and furrows. Those are pretty common across any toothed vertebrate, but um, Jackson's research with Nile crocodiles had suggested there was something that was novel about crocodilian bite marks that would help us identify it. So crocs, the stereotypical croc tooth, and again we've already talked about some groups that moved away from this, but the sort of generic croc tooth is conical with a ridge on it that we call a carina. So you basically have cone-shaped tooth, ridge around that. And when the tooth is freshly erupted, because remember we're mammals, we have two sets of teeth, crocs shed teeth and get new teeth all the time, so they have really old beat-up worn teeth in their mouth at the same time as brand new shiny teeth. 
So the brand new teeth still have a very prominent carina. And what that means is you get basically a bisected mark. So here's the whole puncture of the tooth. And then you'll get this groove on the inside associated with that carina. We haven't seen this in bite marks of other groups. So here are some of his examples. And, and we did find those in our group. So fantastic. We can now identify bite marks that belong to Crocs. So let's go back around to the modern and try to figure out if we can make some predictions about patterns of who should be eating what based on that snout shape, based on the ecological observation, so seeing who's eating what, and then go back into the fossils and say, is this what we're finding? Is this what the bite marks are telling us? Now, you can probably guess things immediately got complicated because diet in these groups shifts a lot with growth. So a little baby alligator is going to be eating things like insects and tadpoles and just small stuff, but then by the time they're fully grown, maybe they decide to nosh on a deer. So you get a lot of diversity in the diet of these groups, and we were having to account for that as we were going through these piles and piles of ecological literature and trying to collate out and find patterns. But I partnered up with a colleague named Eric Wilberg, and we did some very detailed analyses of shape of all of these different groups within what we call crocodiliformes. So that's crocodilia, sort of alligators, crocodiles, gharials, its common descendant, all of its rel uh, relatives. And then crocodiliformes is just sort of going a little further down the family tree, so pulling in more of those weird crocs. So we actually, instead of finding those five groupings that have been discussed before, we found a few more. So the slender snouts, we broke out into two different groups. The surfboard heads are still surfboard heads. They're still weird. The generalists, we also broke out into two different groups, and it's that sort of U versus V-shaped snout. Then we have the little stubby-faced guys and the xiphodont groups. So here are our, our broad classifications when we look at a much more inclusive sampling of the croc family tree. Now, these groups in the boxes are completely extinct. We have no living examples belonging to these groups, but the last three that are up there, we actually do. So we went back and said, okay, well, growth and what things are eating when they're babies versus adults is complicated, but how about we just for our preliminary study, we make it easy. How big does the croc get and what's the biggest prey we've ever seen it eat? And what was nice is that that comparison actually spat out some really nice patterns. So the generalists, um, we see two different sort of lines here. We have the size of the croc and the size of what they're eating. Not quite the same, and I'll show these side by side. And then the slender snouts, again, there, there's a relationship here where it does seem to be predicting things fairly well and they're not doing it the same way. So if you're in that generalized one category, you're eating really big stuff, things that are as big or bigger than yourself. Uh, generalized two, you're eating things that are, I mean, fairly large, but not as big. Um, and then the slender snouts are eating tiny stuff in general. Now, we then go back to the fossil record, and as you expect though, we can't get as broad of a sampling as we would like, and especially not in comparison in, with, say, modern studies. If you wanted to, you could go out all day long and do nothing but watch a bunch of alligators and see what they were eating every day for years. But with the fossil record, we're sort of at the mercy of what we find. And some of the stuff that we find, we're pretty certain is not actually the maximum prey size for what this thing could take. So Goniophilus is an example of one of these Mesozoic groups, so Age of Dinos groups that have that triangular sort of generalist snout shape. And um, we have some bite marks here on some mollusks. Pretty sure that's not the biggest thing they could ever eat. So we're not getting the full range of prey sizes here. And we also get some hinkiness with scavenging. So you can potentially be eating things that are outside of your weight class, basically, if they were already dead, if you didn't have to kill it before you ate it. So we have lots of examples in the fossil record of groups eating like large proboscideans, so elephant relatives that were pretty sure and probably couldn't actually kill an elephant. So we did try to take these fossils and put them in this context, sort of map them against these predictions that we've made for what's the biggest prey item that these things should be able to uh, kill and eat. 
But what's nice is we can start making some predictions about when we might have scavenging. That's been one of those behaviors that we are sure it was happening in the fossil record, but it's sometimes hard to pin down. So for our generalists here, these are just a couple examples of bite marks that we have that are associated with groups that have those generalist snout shapes. So over here, we've got turtle and horse bones with bite marks attributable to crocodilus. Um, this is one of those proboscidean bones down here. Over here, Dinosuchus, so that's one of those giant school bus length alligator relatives. We've got bite marks uh, from Dinosuchus on dinosaur bones. And this one is actually kind of fun. This is a human relative, so ankle bones from one of the early fossil humans. And the croc that's attributed to these bite marks, uh, it's named Crocodilus anthropophagus, the man-eater, because of these bite marks. Now, I, I told you, Clint, that I was going to bring this up. Old study back when both of us were in graduate school, but I think a really nice one because I, I love embedded teeth. I feel like I'm cheating. So people are like, who made this bite mark? I'm like, well, that, that right there. So this one is cheating. It had a tooth stuck in it, but we did also have some nice bisected marks. So we were able to do the study and say, yep, this little juvenile dinosaur was getting munched by a crocodiliform. That same site in Texas I mentioned, again, we have this new species there named Deltasuchus and lots of bite marks that seem to be able to be associated with that group on everything from turtle fragments all the way up to some of the dinosaur bones. So our generalists here, here we have plus fossils and yeah, there's not anything too wacky. We have a couple things that are smaller than expected. Um, generalist 2 gets a little weird though. So here's our predictions based on the modern and all right, here's that Delta Sucus eating a dinosaur, probably not eating within its weight class. And then this over here, honestly, as big as Dinosuchus was, probably scavenging that hadrosaur as well, which is too bad because I do love the paleo art of Dinosuchus popping out and shocking dinosaurs, but alas. Now the slender snouts get to be kind of fun because a lot of our bite marks from slender snouts are not necessarily on things we think they were eating, they were on each other. So these animals were fighting with one another and biting one another. So here are just a couple examples here. But we do have some fossil examples and I love it. Here's our prediction from the modern. What the heck is that? Well, that is Tmistema, one of these false gharials that apparently thought eating an elephant was a good idea. So again, didn't get the memo that it's only supposed to be eating fish. I think we're pretty safe saying that's an example of scavenging as well. We don't have bite marks from the little blunt face guys, which honestly kind of makes sense. They would have been smashing things up and then probably swallowing the bits whole. We don't have bite marks from the surfboard heads, which again, kind of makes sense because especially if they do have that gull or pouch, one interpretation of how these things would eat is to basically take a big gulp and then let water and sediment strain out between these tiny little peg-like teeth they have in their jaws and then leave the food behind and then swallow that whole. So we wouldn't expect bite marks from those groups really. The Xiphodonts, um, again, we, we do have some bite marks on each other, but we also have some gut contents that then also have bite marks. I, I said they existed, they're super rare, but when we get them, they're kind of awesome. Um, so we don't quite have enough to make predictions about those Xiphodonts yet, but we're definitely looking. The next thing that we're hoping to look into with the snout shape change is looking at how this changes across growth, because not only do the little guys, the little babies eat small stuff because they're small, but we also see a change in snout shape as they grow. So are they sort of staying within one classification or are they actually moving across multiple ones as they get bigger? This is a little baby saltwater crocodile as an example, and the tooth next to it is its dad. So just to give you an idea of how much size change we see in members of these groups. Something else that I, I've sort of circled back around to with the bite mark studies, but also those death roll studies, is that these animals fight each other a lot and we get stuck on diet and how is diet affecting snout shape and tooth shape and all of these different characteristics. But interest specific competitions of so basically fighting with each other over resources might also be a really big driver for behavior 
in these groups as well. So I, I love this. You can probably guess from the picture, this is from a golf course. You get some fun pictures of mad alligators on golf courses. So these are two that decided to have a tiff on one of the holes in Florida. Um, so why is it that slender snouts still bite really hard? Why is it that they still death roll? It might have nothing to do with diet. It might have more to do with fighting off rivals who were trying to move in and take their resources. I wanted to throw this in at the end because it's one of my more recent projects. So this is a, a fossil from Kenya that I got to see this last summer. So this skull is oh, just a little shy of a meter long. So this is a really big crocodile. And here's a, a row of bite marks on this thing's face. So again, we, we do actually have a really nice fossil record of these guys fighting with each other pretty far back in the family tree. And this is just one example, I don't know, spoilers, it's not published yet. But um, one example of that that I've been able to see fairly recently. With any research project, um, I feel like a really good study is kind of like putting the band together. So it takes a lot of people working together um, providing access to fossils and collaborating on research. So these are just a couple of people I want to thank for all of this stuff that's both happened in the past and is ongoing. And then I would love to answer questions. So with however much time you guys want to have, thanks. So first question refers to one of your earlier slides. What is a phytosaur? Oh, a phytosaur. Um, so during the Triassic, so first of all, the age of dinosaurs was almost the age of crocodiles. Um, when you get into the Triassic, the croc relatives are honestly the most diverse, the weirdest. They're doing a lot of cool things up on land. Um, but phytosaurs were kind of doing the croc thing before we actually had crocs. So they were, uh, they had that similar body plan. They were probably semi-aquatic ambush predators, which means hide out at the water's edge and pretend to be a log and then pop out at things that come by. But they did have a relatively slender face. If you saw one at a distance, you probably would think croc. But if you get up close, all the details are wrong. And probably the easiest way to tell a phytosaur from a croc is a croc relative, you would expect the nostrils to be at the very tip of the snout. But phytosaurs, they're actually shoved way up on their face, and some of them are even on a pedestal, so it looks like they have a volcano coming out of their forehead. It's kind of bonkers. Um, but they were filling a similar role. It's just, again, these, these early, early croc lion groups doing funky stuff before we then had that in Triassic mass extinction, and the dinosaurs really took over into the Jurassic. All right, so from another, another earlier slide, you had uh, a multiple picture with uh, the phytosaur skull, and if it was a Suchibimus or, or Spinosaur, whichever one it was. Uh, mm -hmm. Two-part question. What is the definition of a crocodile, and how do you get that um, the dinosaur that we're looking at was not a crocodile? Ah, okay. Um, crocodile is a messy term. <laughs> so back, ew, we'll say, before the 1980s, anything that didn't look like a gharial, so it didn't have a skinny face, didn't look like an alligator, so have a broad U-shaped face, we sort of threw it in a pile and called it a crocodile. And as you might expect, once we started actually doing science to figure out how these things are related to one another, things got really messy in a hurry. So I use the word croc really messily, and I apologize for that. We have croc as in true crocodile. So that's going to be crocodilus. That's going to be your dwarf crocs, so osteolemus and its relatives, mechastops. Um, then we have crocodilia. That is what we call a crown group. So basically all of the living species, our alligators, our caimans, our crocodiles, our gharials, all of them, their common ancestor, and then all of its descendants, that's crocodilia. Crocodiliformes is then, we're going further down the family tree, and um, that's pulling in groups that are relatively closely related to crocodilia, but aren't within that bracket. Now, when we look at something like the phytosaurs, they're way down that croc family tree, so Pseudosuchia is what we call that. It's basically everybody closer to crocs than they are to birds. Um, we, with dinosaurs, you have this convergence within some of the spinosaurs. They have these long, slender, skinny faces. And that does look superficially very similar to a croc. 
but then you have to look at the entire rest of the animal. So honestly, the easiest way to identify a dinosaur, I think, is to look at their hips. So dinosaurs uh, have to stand upright. And by upright, I mean their legs are rotated underneath their body. And that's true whether they're walking on two legs or four legs. But just kind of like how we did, but their leg bones are not the same as ours. They're sort of cylindrical at the top. So all of the, the sort of pressure from their femur, their thigh bone, is pressing up against this ledge of bone, but not into the hip. So our hip is a ball and socket joint, so we've got a cup and it moves around like that. Dinosaurs have a hole there. It's not a cup of bone, it's just a hole. So I, I love to horrify my family at Thanksgiving by showing that turkeys are totally dinosaurs because they have a hole in their hip. Um, so if we look basically everywhere from like the eyes back on the Spinosaur, everything else is, no man, that's, that's totally a dinosaur, that's not a croc. It just has this sort of convergent snout shape, which we see this all over um, in paleontology. If you have different groups that are possibly trying to fill similar roles in their ecosystems, there's only so many ways you can take a basic vertebrate body and make it do certain jobs. So long skinny face, lots of groups did that. Uh, you go back even further and we look at some of these early um, amphibians and they have long skinny faces probably because they were living in the water or doing similar things. Do they live in herds or what is the term for a group of crocodiles? I would actually have to look up what a group of crocs is called. That's tragic, isn't it? I should know that. Um, these groups, they are remarkably social. We sometimes don't give crocs credit because we're like, oh, they're reptiles and reptiles are dumb. But the more research we do, the more we realize that they're actually really smart. Um, and actually many reptilian groups are extremely smart. It's just the way we're testing them has been sort of geared towards how we test mammals and it doesn't always spit out good results. But uh, one way of, of sort of understanding how intelligent they really are is there's been some recent wor uh, work on sort of the zoo side of things with training them. And it surprises people like, wait, they can learn their names and they can learn commands. And I, I would say, I joke that they're maybe as cooperative as a cat. Like they know what you want them to do. They just might not cooperate and actually do it. Um, but they are capable of learning things. Oh, I see in the chat, and you're absolutely right. I, I had heard that. A group of crocodiles is called a basque. Um, so the whole reason I'm, I'm coming up to this with the behavior is that they're incredibly social. So I, I would remember when I would go in to St. Augustine in the mornings before they opened to the public, a lot of the, the big male alligators would be bellowing. And you can look up a video of this on YouTube. It's called a water dance. So they'll basically get right at the surface of the water and they have this very deep rumble and the water starts dancing on their backs. So they're very vocal. They're very social. They're sometimes maybe not so nice to one another as we saw with the, all those examples of them fighting, but they're quite smart and they have really complicated social behaviors. So I don't, um, I guess usually when I, I think about this in, in the fossil record, we draw from evidence like trackways of multiple individuals all moving together, and we don't have much um, in that sort of direction. But from looking at the modern, we would expect that at least during certain points in the year, they would have been really social animals. Uh, so th this one I'm going to kind of build on. Uh, it okay. says, how, how fast are they? Now we've heard of the high walk and a gallop, so how fast are they? Oh, um, really fast at the water's edge and then slowing down the further away they get. I, um, the high walk is not usually a very quick motion. Um, so just to, to go through the different gates, we have the belly crawl or the low rock, and that's when they have a sprawling posture and their legs are out to the side. And they can actually hustle from that. So if you ever like scare one and it's near the water, they can just jump right down into the water very quickly. The high walk, they rotate their legs underneath their body and then they can walk like that, but it's not very quick. And then we do see a true gallop in these groups. Now, when we say gallop, we mean all four legs off the ground at the same time. And it looks bonkers. They, they look like funny rabbits. They're just like boing, boing, boing. But I think that the cap is about eight feet, 
because these animals are much better adapted at swimming in the water and that big powerful tail is great because you can throw it in an S curve and push yourself through the water really quickly. But once you're up on land, you're basically towing a boat anchor behind yourself. So once these animals get over, I think it's about eight feet, they can't gallop anymore. Now an eight foot croc galloping is impressive um, though it usually seems to be because they're trying to get away from something, not towards you. So these groups really do, when they're, uh, when they're hunting in the modern, they're relying on surprising you. They're going to hang out at the water's edge and act like a log, and then if you get too close, then they're going to pop out. Um, and that comes back to the whole, like, people telling you to run in a zigzag line, which, uh, no. Um, <laughs> first of all, you're probably not going to have enough time to think about that, so my recommendation is just run in a straight line as fast as you can away from the animal. Because if they don't get you in that initial lunge, they, they do slow down an awful lot up on land because they have that great big tail that they're dragging behind. So don't... I, what was the Shark Week special where they were like, get Olympic swimmers beat a great white in a swimming pool? I'm like... I know where this is going and the answer is no. Like it's, it's kind of the same way with the movie Crawl where I'm like, I don't care how good of a swimmer you are on your college swim team, the alligator's gonna win, but we're better adapted up on land. So if they don't get you in that initial lunge, you're just, just get away fast. No zigzags, straight line. <laughs> Do any crocodiles eat plants? Plants, not, well, okay pause. <laughs> None of the modern ones are specifically adapted as either omnivores or herbivores, but they have been observed eating fruit. Maybe they just like it. I don't know. Uh, so it does happen occasionally. And again, we, we love making boxes and then putting things in boxes to try to communicate concepts in really any branch of science. Right? So we look at the modern groups more like semi-aquatic ambush predator carnivorous. But as with many things in nature, nature gives no concern to our classification scheme and it's usually a spectrum. Um, so just like dogs will eat, you know, plants from time to time, alligators have been observed eating fruit. But when we go back into the fossil record though, we do get groups that have really like weirdly wussy jaws and these leaf-shaped complicated teeth and uh, multi-cusped sort of weird complicated teeth that seem to suggest they were probably eating plants. Maybe not exclusively, so some of them were probably omnivores, but uh, Cymosuchus, which sometimes gets called pug crocked because there was, I don't know, there was a thing for a few years and where they would give everything boar croc and pug croc and uh, pancake croc. Um, that Delta Sucus got nicknamed Nutcracker Croc because of eating the turtles, which just made me laugh because it made me think about like pulling the tail up and then bites. No. Um, but Cymosuchus is probably the most adapted to being a plant eater. It, like, its head is almost a cube. It's completely covered in armor. I totally want one for a pet, so I'm very upset that they're all dead. But that one was probably full-blown herbivore. How many teeth do crocodiles have? It depends. <laughs> so uh, different groups are going to have different numbers. As you might expect, like the really long snouted guys tend to have more. The shorter snouted guys tend to have fewer, but it's, it ranges. Um, God, what was that little, the little guy from Texas, I think only had nine teeth in its lower jaw. Um, so on one side, so, you know, 18 if you had everybody. Um, but then you'll look at something like a gharial and that number is like 60 in some of these groups. So it, it really depends on which group you're talking about. If a crocodile is, is attacking on land versus water, are they still doing the death roll on land or is that just a water thing? They can do it up on land. Um, that picture from the golf course, they were actually, one of them was trying to death roll and the other one, kind of like an Aikido, was just going with it because you'd rather roll with them than try to fight once that starts. Um, it's a lot, I think it's easier for them in the water just because you have the buoyancy sort of holding you up and, and helping that process along. But uh, especially when they're trying to escape. So some of the observations we were making, it wasn't just giving them food and letting them death roll with a food item. 
Uh, this is also a method that they try to use to get away if a zookeeper is needing to capture them for whatever reason, you know, relocation or a veterinary check. They'll start trying to roll to get away, and they'll do that on land. It's it seems to this is just their their instinctive way of saying like let go of me, and they try to get away that way. How many babies do they have in a clutch? Ah, um, again, are are putting things in boxes and then nature not caring. We often talk about groups of organisms either having a very small number of young and then expending a lot of energy taking care of that young to try to make sure they get to adulthood. So that's like humans and whales. So you might have one, two, or maybe three at a time. And then the other end of that spectrum is something like a sea turtle, where you'll have uh, hundreds potentially of eggs in a nest but the energy was all expended in the number of offspring and then mama sea turtle buries the eggs, goes back to the sea, and they're sort of left to their own. And the idea there is that some of them will make it to adulthood. Um, but crocs, which it's, it's both a cool thing about their biology and it's a really convenient thing for their conservation, is they kind of do both. Like they don't have sea turtle sized nests, but you can expect, and again it differs by species and it differs by the age of the, uh, the animals involved, but you can have a few dozen in a nest at a time, and you often see parental care. So mom and or dad um, hangs out at the nest and keeps predators away from it. They will hang around and help take care of the young. Um, I don't know, tip, if you guys are ever in Florida and you find a baby alligator, don't pick it up because it's going to start making a distress call and any adult in the area is going to eat your face. So, um, leave them alone. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's nice because they still, you know, you look at wild animals, they still have an absurdly high death rate early on in life, but it's kind of given them a little bit of help so that maybe more of them make it a little bit longer. And it's also why when we put protections in place, everybody kind of forgets that the American alligator was one of the first species that was put on the endangered species list. And it was also one of the first species to be taken off of it because once we had protections in place, this reproductive strategy sort of puts them in a good position to bounce back. So once we stopped, you know, wiping them all out for shoes, they bounce back really, really quickly. And now they're just all over the place. And you know, nobody thinks about alligators when they think about endangered groups in North America anymore. All right, so on, on to the, the nest question as well. So if the, the mother is taking care of the, the babies in the nest, um, how, how are crocodile or crocodilian relationships? Is, is there, um, does dad stick around? Does, um, is it a group effort? Do they mate for life? Um, usually, well, you know when breeding season's happening in Florida because that's when you start finding crocodiles and alligators, because we have both in Florida, in weird places. Because essentially what's going on is the males are fighting with each other for access to the females. So if you are the biggest, baddest alligator in the pond, you're going to kick out all of your rivals, and then those smaller males are going to end up in people's swimming pools because they're trying to find somewhere to go. Um, so you can actually track this pretty well. Like you start watching the Florida news and it's like, oh, alligators showing up in weird places, must be breeding season. So the males will fight with each other and then basically kick everybody else out and then you might have a single male with lots of females in an area. So it's not really for life, it's more sort of who won out in that competition than everyone else got kicked out. Um, as to who sticks around and parental care, it's, it differs by species, so usually the female will stick around at least some, but even within a single species you might have, I don't know, super moms and then like eh, eh, moms, um, and then some groups the males will also stick around as well, so I, I think there's a, a beautiful picture out there of male gharials. So you can tell males during the breeding season because they get these big lumpy things at the very end of their snout and it's sort of for display. Um, but they'll actually nest sort of collectively so then you get all of these baby gharials in this crèche and then there's these beautiful photographs of this enormous dad because gharials are some of the longest living crocs just covered in like dozens and dozens of little baby gharials hanging out on their heads. Um, so it, it depends on the species as to whether or not 
dad sticks around to help hang out with the kids and guard the nest too. How big could Borealisuchus get? Borealisuchus? Didn't you have a ridiculously large Borealisuchus skull in your collections, Clint? Am I remembering that correctly? Rocky Chansa. Ah, darn. I am not remembering it. Borealisuchus. How big does Borealisuchus get? I mean, it wasn't a giant. It wasn't one of the big school bus ones, so modern range, I guess you could say. Not terribly huge. I think some of the biggest ones that we've got are like 12 to 15 feet. Yeah, so alligatory. I've been cracking up at the people who are like, the, I guess a bunch of counties in Florida are saying, for social distancing, stay one large alligator apart from one another. And I'm like, six feet is not a large alligator. Then again, if you want to stay like 15 feet away from me, I'm not going to stop you. So I would like for people to keep a dinosuchus length away from me. So uh, somebody has noticed your last name and is wondering <laughs> if you have been to Drumheller, Alberta or the Royal Terrell Museum. Let's talk about me being bitter for a second. No, um, <laughs> SVP was actually held near Drumheller. Uh, and I had just given birth to my second child, so all of my friends uh, sent me pictures from Drumheller and sent me, like, license plates and postcards, and I was very sad. Um, no, it's, it is definitely on the bucket list for obvious reasons. It's like, gee, I share a name and they're known for their paleo, but I have miserably failed to actually get up there and visit yet. Uh, we have the classic... Who would win, an alligator or a crocodile? Well, again, it kind of depends. Um, the, the largest modern crocodiles we have, and the ones that are sort of the, the known man-eaters, I guess you could say, are your Nile crocs and your saltwater crocs. And they definitely get bigger than American alligators. And we were going to talk about Chinese alligators who I love, they're adorable, but like a big old male Chinese alligator is like five or six feet long. Um, so they're, they're little bitty. So between an American alligator and a Nile croc or a saltwater croc, it's gonna be a crocodile. But you know, then again, you go back in the fossil record and we get groups that are, you know, 30 plus feet long and I, I would match up Dinosuchus, which is an alligator relative against the saltwater crocodile any day of the week and twice on Saturdays. So <laughs> alligators uh, do tend to be on the sort of taking larger prey side of things. And part of that might be because the crocodiles have, they are themselves extremely large and there's plenty of prey that are of equivalent sizes in their ecosystems. But it seems like Alligators um, don't specialize in things that are bigger than themselves, but if given the opportunity, they've been documented eating like cows. So they'll go after much bigger prey. Okay, looks like we are reaching the end of our, our questions here. Um, okay. And unless any panelists have had anything. Becky. Yes. So there was one question I answered in the chat that I wanted to bring up um, in case Stephanie had more input on it. Somebody asked um, if there's anything that hunts crocodiles. And I mentioned in the chat, there's those videos of the leopards hunting crocodiles in Africa, but I wasn't sure if Stephanie had any other animals that she knew of that also will hunt Stupid alligators animals. or crocodiles. Um, baby alligators or crocodiles kind of get picked on by everybody. Um, no, I, I've seen lots of videos of some of the big cats in South America hunting caimans. Um, and it's, it's actually a really specialized behavior because they'll basically sneak up on the caiman and bite it right at the back of the skull and per basically sever the spinal column, which is perfectly gruesome and highly effective. Um, uh, fight between a Nile crocodile and a hippo. Hippo will win that one. So don't, don't mess with hippos. We, we look at them and they're like, they're big and roly-poly and cute. No, no, <laughs> leave them alone. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're a big male American alligator hanging out in the Everglades, just about the only thing that you really need to worry about other than another alligator is a person. Um, so once they get to be really large, it, that's, they don't have to worry about many other groups. Now, cannibalism is like 
a Tuesday for these guys. Um, so they fight a lot, and then if they actually manage to kill another one during that fight, well, now they're convenient food. So um, another alligator is actually a pretty major concern if you're an alligator. But in terms of things specializing in hunting them, really just us. There's, they're, they're not any croc specialists, I guess you could say, that I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, we did have one question earlier on, I forgot about it, <laughs> uh, which I'll, I'll kind of modify a little bit, as far as, you know, like, crocodiles get into some massive battles, and, like, limbs missing, and chunks yep. missing, and they survive. Um, what can you tell us about, like, how they can survive such gruesome injuries? I was going to bring that up, too, because that was a, a question that I answered before we got started early on in the chat. Um, there's two things. First of all, if you talk to a crocodilian geneticist, they will tell you stories where if you try to take a blood sample and you mess it up and you don't get it the first time, uh, crocs are actually able to sort of shunt off the blood flow to their extremities. So like if you don't get that, that stick on the first round, then you're going to have to walk away and come back later because that croc is just like, nope. They're incredibly obstinate animals to do research with. Um, and they have absurd immune systems. And this is something that there's some researchers in Louisiana, and I'm flaking out on the name of the guy who's running the, the lab. Merchant, maybe? Um, anyway, these guys have absurdly powerful antibacterials, antifungals, and antivirals in their blood. And they've actually been trying to figure out how to take that and turn it into a medicine. This is one of these classic examples of people looking at folk remedies and trying to see, is there some truth behind the old folk remedy? Because apparently uh, some people in parts of Louisiana will take a piece of alligator meat, and if you have like a cut or a sore in your mouth, they'll put it in there, which I don't particularly recommend because salmonella is a thing. But they were looking into this to see if there was anything to it. Like, why, why would you do that? And does it have any effect? And that's when they figured out that these animals just have bonkers immune systems. So it, it's actually, I think the last I heard is they're so ridiculous that the, it'll just kill anything. Uh, but it'll also go after things like human blood cells. So they figured out how to turn it into like a topical ointment, but not anything that can be like injected or ingested so far. Um, but what that means is, is if you're an alligator and you're in a swamp fighting it out um, and you get an arm torn off, they can shun off the blood flow to that injury, and their immune system is going to start attacking any of that stuff that's getting into the injury, so it ends up being more survivable. Like, if, if you or I were to get in a fight, and I had an arm off, and then I lay around in a swamp all day, it would not go well for me, but the combination of those two factors make them much more capable of surviving. And we have some potentially indirect evidence that this goes pretty far down the croc family tree because I, I described some bite marks on um, a rawasukid, so one of these big terrestrial early sort of croc line Triassic things. And there was a tooth stuck in it, you know, and a whole bunch of bite marks and no evidence of infection. I mean, if I was walking around with like an alligator tooth stuck in my hip, it would be horribly infected and gross, so. Okay. Looks like that is the end. Yep. <laughs> so thank that you so much for, for like joining us. <laughs> no, no, thanks for having me. I hope um, I hope people enjoyed it. Oh. We had a lot of good questions. This will be fun to edit. <laughs> I'm seeing some of the margins, like, can you have a pet croc? I'm like, can, can you and should you? you? <laughs> These are... And to, to answer but like that, it differs by the state. <laughs> so there's a really weird idea in some state laws that caimans are small. So they'll sometimes say you can have a caiman, and I'm like, black caiman, not small. Black caiman is so. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was fun, guys. Thanks. <laughs> okay, we'll pass the mic over to to Clint. And what are we looking at for tomorrow? Ah, tomorrow, Thursday, April 9th, we will be talking to Dr. Nick Famoso from John Day Fossil Beds National Monument out in Oregon, and he is going to be talking to us about the evolution of horses and some of the early horse ancestors that we had here in North America. 
So everyone who loves horses, tomorrow's the day to come and learn all about the history of horses. Awesome, awesome. All right, well, we'll see everybody here tomorrow at 10 a.m. And stay safe, and we'll see you next time.